Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Can everyone hear us and see us? Hey there. So everyone that's joining, welcome. Um, you'll find that your mics are muted. It's just to, to have a little bit of organized chaos. It would be impossible if we had everyone's mics <laughs> on. <laughs> um, if we can ask yeah. also, if you don't mind, um, keeping your webcams off. It's nice to see everyone's beautiful faces, but just to keep um, bandwidth at, at its lowest, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop your videos. Cool. We'll so the, yeah. yeah, sorry, Nadav. No, I just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, we're going to be starting this in around maybe one or two minutes. Just let everyone um, tune in. It's quite exciting. We have uh, quite a lot of people already so far. Um, it's going to be really uh, such a fun thing to do, and, and we're all going to learn a lot. Um, and yeah, please remember this is a interactive course it's a q a so send in your questions and uh we will try and uh answer them yeah thanks nadav um so if you look at your screens you'll see there's a uh, a participants menu at the bottom or sometimes if you're on a device a tablet or a phone it might be at the top um if you open up that you can also open up your chat box um, if you've got any questions, you can use that to to chat to to us. Um, I'll send I'll send you all a, a little chat message. Cool. So if you've got any questions going through the the session, please just use the chat box because your microphones will be muted. Perfect. And um, basically, Aldo and Emil are going to be running the. Uh, the course here, I'll be looking at the Facebook comments, the YouTube comments. Um, so please, if you have questions and you're not watching on the Zoom, uh, you can feel free to just send in your comments. Um, it's so nice to see already a lot of the regulars that join us for all our live streams tuning in already. Um, so yeah, I think maybe one or two more minutes and uh, we'll be ready to, to start. Oh, Thanks. I just see, so everyone, Nazim Mohammed, he just said, how's it on, on Zoom? And he actually filmed one of the videos that we're going to be analyzing today. So, uh, awesome. uh, yeah, Excellent. nice to see you here. Uh, we invited all the filmmakers today. Um, so, yeah, it's cool to see that you guys have joined. <laughs> Nazim, it's going to be really nice talking about your video. Yeah, no, no definitely. <laughs> so, uh, we've got gonna people from, sorry, Nadev. Yeah. I'm going to be sharing just the links to the videos as well in case uh, Zoom kind of like stutters or cuts out so that you can all watch uh, in HD. Awesome. So should we, should we get going? Um, I think there's quite a few already online um, mm -hmm. and maybe we can just introduce ourselves while we wait for a few others. Um, it's really nice to, to have this opportunity Nadav to to join later sightings and this is quite special hey to to do something like this live yeah definitely um you know especially during lockdown we we've always been real-time sightings but uh you know now the parks are closed we've found really entertaining ways of keeping everyone engaged and we've been doing live streams of uh from mala mala we also had a researcher do a live stream q a and and i think a bird course is something that anyone who's part of our community will love and will learn a lot, uh, even for me, um, you know, so, so yeah, it's really exciting. Definitely. So, so uh, Nadav, Aldo and I came up with this idea during lockdown. Yeah. Um, both of us run tour companies and we're both guides. Um, the difference between me and Aldo is he's a specialist bird guide and I'm just a guide. Um, but <laughs> we, we, we were trying to fix this, this sort of cabin fever um, that that was happening. Um, we we really needed our fix of of going out with people on tour, and so we came out with this idea of running interactive classes. 
um, and in particular birding. So that's where the, the, the thought of birding with Aldo first came up. So I think it's a good opportunity then, a good time to, to speak to Aldo, have Aldo introduce himself. <laughs> Hi everyone, and a couple of my friends there in Wales. Hello to you. Um, look, everyone, I've, I've been in, interested in birds for 54 years now, years ago and by. And from being a bird watcher as a boy, it, it graduated into me doing bird research. And then I was the first director of BirdLife South Africa. And now, currently, uh, tourism permitting, I'm a specialist tour guide. And uh, I've got a good list of, of birds under my belt, 837 for Southern Africa. But throughout, throughout my life, you know, it's always, I've always been really keen on introducing people to birds and showing people new things about birds. Uh, and hence then birding with Aldo and Kruger with Aldo, these courses that uh, we are running. And now, what a wonderful opportunity with later sighting. So, hello to you all. Thanks, Aldo. And just again, before we get going, um, just <clears throat> roughly what we're going to do today is we're going to take three really noteworthy videos. Um, and we've got some of the content creators like Nazim listening in. And we're going to just talk through them. Um, um, just and quickly, uh, Emil, as well, can you just show our... Um, our faces on the side. I'm not sure if you can do that because uh, a lot on Facebook and YouTube are just seeing the the screen, um, like kind of just the the, the sure, presentation. Sure, let me just. Um, there we go. It should be pinning Aldo's um, webcam now. Do you see that? Um, let's see. Yes. Okay, I can see it. Okay, cool. perfect. Okay. So um, remember, it's it's an interactive thing. Normally, our classes are about maximum 15 screens um, it's really awesome to have so many screens but the the point is if you have a question for Aldo let's let's put him on the spot and ask him a question or two um, and use the chat box to to ask anything so let's go um, let's watch this first video um, it's a pretty epic life and death battle between two birds um, Nadav who, who shot this video so uh, we received this video from uh, a Hurt Jan, uh, but he he works at uh, Sabi Park, which is just outside um, uh, Kr Paul Kruger Gate there. Um, and so one of the people who work there actually filmed this and sent it to him to to share the video with us. Uh, and this uh, video is, is just an amazing interaction. Um, it has over 23 million views on YouTube. Um, and it's just a... A crazy battle but i'm going to let you uh kind of uh explain the rest and and actually analyze you know what's going on here great let's get the video going and then i'll stop it a little bit into it so although this is a good spot right yeah i mean it's such stunning footage every time i see it i'm just blown away well Little sparrow hawk tackling a Jacobin cuckoo, uh, and truly a life and death struggle. Well, for the Jacobin, um, yeah, there it is. Now, now Aldo, if, if people are looking up in their books, a little sparrow hawk, it's going to look a little bit like the pick on the right that's just come up. Quite different to <laughs> the pick in this video. Yeah, look, these, the identification of these, uh, these small occipiters, as they call the sparrowhawks and goshawks, is difficult. And on top of adult plumage, as you see on the right, you've got juvenile plumages uh, included in that variation. So it's tough. Uh, and that's one of the things we teach in birding with Aldo and Kruger with Aldo, processes for identifying birds. Um, but here, we're looking at those blotchy teardrops on the front, the greenish yellow sear, which is the, the, the soft skin behind the beak um, and uh, pale eyes. These are great characters for identifying a little sparrowhawk. Okay, great. And then when it comes to the Jacobin, um, any other species of cuckoo that are, are similar in the Kruger? 
Yes, you know, Kruger is a great place for cuckoos. Eh? And uh, Jacobin, there is a similar cuckoo called Leviance or striped cuckoo, uh, which is rather more heavily, well, it is heavily streaked on the, on the breast compared to Jacobin, which can have a few fine streaks. And Jacobin, by the way, also comes in an all black form, uh, but always there is that white patch in the wing that you can see, uh, well, the bird struggling on the ground there, as well as the still image. Thanks, Aldo. So let's let's watch a little bit more. And as we watch, is this normal behavior for a sparrowhawk? I well, yeah. I mean, they they kill birds. the The remarkable thing here, though, is that that cuckoo may weigh exactly the same as as that little sparrowhawk. So it is attacking something right at the extreme edge of of the normal range of its prey. They would normally be going for baubles and, and smaller birds than that. So that cuckoo is probably verging on 80 grams. And, and the little sparrowhawk, you know, it's a juvenile bird. Uh, it could even be less than that, but it's going to be 80 or 90 grams. So they're more or less the same yeah. weight. It's remarkable. It's a crazy battle. And now um, we've paused it here. The the sparrowhawks actually starting to pluck at the, the Jacobin. Yeah, the, so sparrowhawks, you know, after they've killed a bird, they will, they will pluck it so that they can eat the flesh. So this now is plucking before the, way before the bird is dead. And uh, I'll put it down to one or two things. It's either so stimulated and agitated by uh, this battle that it's, it's lost track of, of events or, or else this is another function of it being a juvenile that, um, you know, it hasn't got its sequence and timing right. Predators take time to learn their trade. And uh, I think this juvenile hasn't got there yet. Yeah, yeah look at that battle there. Eh? So although cuckoos get a pretty bad reputation. Now, if you look at the video that was posted on latest sightings of this actual video, um, people are saying uh, the cuckoo got what it what it deserves. Why is that? Um, I, I, this all refers to the fact that cuckoos are, are nest parasites. In other words, they lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and uh, then their host birds, as they call, it, will raise the cuckoo chicks. Uh, so they outsourcing the raising of their chicks uh, to another species, which is quite a remarkable thing, really. But uh, one interesting thing here is that, you know, the, the Jacobin cuckoo does not parasitize sparrowhawks. They normally use bulbuls as their hosts. And in fact, I don't know of any cuckoo that parasitizes a raptor anywhere. Uh, and so... Also, with this being a juvenile bird, there is certainly nothing around the fact that this bird is a cuckoo that has led to the little sparrowhawk attacking it. So, as the video says now, moments after the camera stopped rolling, the cuckoo flew to safety. That's good news for the cuckoo, but was it unexpected? Yeah, well, you know, my take on this is that this is all one real big mistake on the part of this little sparrowhawk. It's a juvenile bird, and I think it's taken something far too big. Clearly, uh, you can see all this protracted struggle. It didn't have a really killing grip on the bird. And in fact, being dragged around like that means that that little sparrowhawk was at risk of, of injury <laughs> itself. Now you think, you know, finely honed flying bird, um, uh, you can damage something in a struggle like that, and that can be the end of your life as a predator. So I think this is a mistake. And the fact that this bird, the cuckoo, got away is, is further evidence of that. I think that's it. I think the uh, little sparrowhawk has learned a serious lesson today, and uh, on this day rather, and would downgrade its expectations to something uh, more appropriate in size. <laughs> Very good point. So he probably learned uh, from from this encounter. I, so I, Aldo, I, I, carry on. Sorry, so I, I just wanted to say, so 
so you mentioned right at the beginning, it, it is difficult to identify birds, um, especially if it's a juvenile or if it's busy changing its molt. Um, how do the, the, the courses that we've developed help um, someone um, to improve in their birding? Well, you know, Emil, people are faced with a book with so, so many images and, and stuff. So um, it's overwhelming in the beginning. So what we do in our courses is, is uh, in the process of teaching people how to take a mental snapshot by focusing on different areas of the bird and remembering key areas, we then make people familiar with the book and with different groups of birds, what to look for and when. And this kind of background knowledge is enormously helpful for people who are trying to get into this birding business when you're faced with this huge diversity in the beginning. So we try and make it a, a happy, smooth process becoming a birder. And it's been fun hosting them, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, Dove, any questions from, from um, YouTube or Facebook? Cool. So on, on Facebook and YouTube, everyone's just uh, amazed <laughs> by the video. Um, so we got one comment from uh, 4X Gold. He's just saying he's not a birder, but this is just so fascinating to him. Um, but we did get a question uh, from Mrs. Lapwing. Uh, she, she basically asked, what's the size difference? Um, and I think you did answer in terms of weight. Um, and, but this is a juvenile, obviously. So when, it, when it's not a juvenile, is there a massive size difference between these two birds? Okay, so most flying birds, when they leave the nest, are pretty close to adult size. Okay. Um, they, in the case of something like a raptor, they might be, say, 10% lighter as a real rough rule of thumb. But uh, so it could be, as I said, that um, in terms of body weights, I'm guessing that that sparrowhawk is just a few grams heavier at 85, possibly 90 grams versus the cuckoos 75 to 80 grams something like that okay cool and then i had a question um just from me watching this video um you know you could see the the defeathering in the middle like does that can that affect the flight does like does the bird losing all its feathers does it like hinder it at all that's uh, that's a that's a great question now you would have seen where the feathers came off they were taken off the belly and okay. the function of feathers in that area is primarily about insulation. And uh, so it would have lost a few feathers down there. It would not affect the flight at all. If, if the cuckoo had lost wing feathers or tail feathers, then you can look at some uh, potential serious impact on its ability to fly. I, I okay. would expect the cuckoo just to, to regrow that little patch of feathers uh, and assuming that it survived the attack, um, uh, all would be well. Okay, cool. So I think that's more or less um, all the questions for, for this video on the social media platforms. Um, happy to go on to the next one. Thanks, Nadab. Great. Right. Cool. So is, um, sorry, what's the biggest bird the hawk will take? That's a question from Nazim. Nazim, I think you're looking at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when, I looked at, uh, when I looked at this, I couldn't find any bird bigger than a Jacobin cuckoo in the list of prey items. So this is it. This is the record. Uh, Joan asks, do these hawks attack on ground or air? Um, and is this usual behavior? They will, they are, they, can, they hunt in two ways. So they can be ambush hunters, um, uh, either coming from a perch or uh, flying through heavy cover and then snatching birds. So in those situations, they can kill birds on the ground or, or on the perch, or I assume they will also catch a bird just as it's taking off. But it's not like a falcon where there may be a long attack in the air with you know a long approach, it's it's a short, sharp attack which can end on the ground or or very close to it. Great, so, uh, sorry, 
No, a, a question um, from online as well um, was how do you think the, the Sparrowhawk would have initially grabbed the cuckoo in this case? Do you think it would have been like just on the ground or like what do you think? Um, well, the cuckoos would normally be sitting on a perch. They, they're not exactly as the still image is there. So they're not on the ground much at all. So okay. I'm, I'm guessing that the, the cuckoo would have been sitting somewhere and then the sparrow hawk came um, in an ambush attack and grabbed it. It seems yeah. to have caught it fairly low down on the side. Uh, and, you know, for all the struggling in that, the cuckoo seemed almost as strong at the end as it was in the beginning. Um, so I, yeah. I think the, the grab it made was also substandard. It was subpar. And that is also part of what I suggest is the inexperience of youth in this case, of uh, still learning its trade as a, as a predator. Nazim, good, good news for you on the cuckoo. It did get away <laughs> successfully. So all's well. That ends well for the cuckoo, at least. Um, last question. Jenna Nev um, asked, would the feathers regrow on the next molt? Um, I think in circumstances like this, they might grow immediately rather than awaiting a molt. Uh, a little bit, I'm open to, to some doubt there, but at the very least, it, it would be at the next molt, which assuming this was um, kind of middle of summer, they would tend to molt around about February, March or so. Thanks. Thanks, Aldo. And then, <laughs> sorry, the, the questions are kind of flying in. Um, another one was, Oh, from Tour Soweto, um, are any of these birds uh, migratory? Like, do they are, are both of these birds in South Africa all the time, or you know, do they migrate? Yeah, so the little sparrowhawks are, are resident, but the the Jacobin cuckoos are migratory, um, okay. and and there are populations actually that come from <laughs> from from India as well as from uh, Central East Africa. Um, now, one of the populations of Jacobin cuckoo breed here. Uh, the others that come from further east, in fact, are non-breeding population. Really, really interesting migration uh, uh, situation. Uh, most of the cuckoos which come here to South Africa in the summer um, breed here, and most of them all of them, I think, are migratory. All our cuckoos. Yeah, I think that's right. Oh, okay, cool. Perfect. So, Nadav, so, the next video we have, um, Marshall, Eagle, and Warthog. Is, is that Nazim's video? Yes, that is the one. <laughs> it's, uh, many... it's amazing because... So, I was just on Facebook the one day scrolling through my feed and... Um, I just saw this video, it was incredible. And I saw Nazim posted it and I just kind of asked him if we could share it with our community. Um, and everyone's loved it. I mean, it's such an amazing sighting and it's also so rare for, for people to be forming like a group of warthogs and stuff like that. And so to actually get the, 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 the sight of the eagle coming in and actually, you know, the, the impact um, is, is something I've never seen before. So we shared it. Um, and this video, let me just check, um, but it's, it's on um, uh, 17 million views. So it's been seen by 17 Crazy. million people around the world. <laughs> um, that's, how, that's how rare this is. And, and what's also cool is you can really hear their excitement because it's something how I would react if I would have seen something like this, you know? So, so yeah, I think... Um, that's what's special about this video. Um, and I think, yeah, let's, let's play it. And, and yeah, well, well done, everyone. Azim. Especially <laughs> for starting off just taking a video of uh, a family <laughs> of warthog. So you can see in this clip, the, the piglets are tiny. Mm. On the road again. Hey, so gonna, gonna Watch this. Oh, oh, we're gonna pick on up, got one. <laughs> oh my god, we saw a kill. <laughs> uh, I love that. We saw a kill. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, like we've all we've all reacted like that, literally. You know, it's 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 exciting to see. <laughs> and and this is such a good spot to to stop and just talk about about the the, the eagle here. Aldo, mm. can you just help us identify a martial eagle? Yeah, sure. No, Nazim, fantastic footage. I would have been even more excited than you, I think. This is a, a martial eagle. So this is one of the three big African eagles uh, weighing uh, up to, say, four and a half or around four and a half kilograms for the female. And the males will be maybe a kilogram less than that. But if you look carefully at it, you can see white underparts with the black spotting and that separates it in particular from the black chested snake eagle which which we do in kruger with aldo we separate the, the identification of these two um but the one of the other things to watch for through this video are the huge feet of of this um martial eagle as it as it deals with this warthoglet so is this is this usual prey for the martial eagle? They they will normally catch prey within the range of one to five kilograms. So this would be in that range. I mean, I'm guessing outright here that that's maybe two or three kilograms, maybe even four for that little hoglet there. Um, so this would be a normal prey, and martial eagles um, characteristically characteristically will take a wide range of prey, including large birds like, like bustards and uh, um, spurfowl and so on. Uh, they also take a lot of small predators like mongooses and they've been recorded as taking jackals, for example, as well as things like really young impala, you know, this really small buck they are capable of killing. Let's watch a little bit further on at, at some point. Here we go. At, at this point here, the, the eagle flies off. The martial eagle flies off. Why, why do you think that is? I, I'm guessing, and, and I'm happy Nazim's here because maybe he can confirm it. I'm guessing that the arrival of other vehicles here may have well scared off the, off the eagle. I'd love to hear from Nazim if that was the moment. Yeah, there we go. Um, it was the arrival of other vehicles that, that scared off the eagle. And here he's not letting it go. Here he comes walking back in. I say he, it could well be a, a female bird, of course. Okay, we can actually see all the vehicles that have come up in the mm. background there. So here we see the martial eagle walking over the street um over the road and we get a pretty good view of of this the side profile here um how do, how do these martial eagles actually kill their prey um well yeah this is this it's a nice still shot here um if you see the upper picture you've also timed it very nicely there emil look at the size of the rear talon just to the right of the picture, it is massive. So the, the killing takes place, um, it can happen, the impact alone may help the eagle to develop a, a, or, or deliver rather a killing blow. But otherwise, that long talon that you see on the back of the foot in particular can be used to, to uh, essentially strangle or penetrate some vital functions. You can imagine that talon pressing in around the heart and the arteries, for example, can very, very quickly lead to, lead to death uh, on, the, on the part of the prey. I mean, that's amazing. Look at it dragging that, that hoglet across the road. Sure. And then the video basically ends here with the martial eagle under the bush. Why does it drag it under the bush here? Yeah, he's got his beak open there. I'm guessing all of this has is, is been pretty hard work struggling with that that war talk and and you know birds of prey cannot sweat like we do so i think i think it's panting i think it's offloading heat so it's getting into the shade to cool off um you've got to keep body temperature within bounds so best place under 
in some shade. Thanks, Aldo. So I see, um, Joan, did, did Aldo answer that question already? So the question uh, was, was the kill done through suffocation? Cool. Oh, okay. Do, do, eagles, do eagles ever um, kill through suffocation? I, I think it can happen in a sense. Um, uh, you, you see how big that foot is. You can mm. imagine that <laughs> foot then grabbing a prey uh, and crushing like the rib cage area. So mm. it, it would suffocate in that way rather than we tend to think of suff suffocation as, as being around the neck as such. So I think very often they may well just crush a rib cage of a, of a small prey and, and end its life that way. Alda, um, Aunt Andrew von Veik asks, how much of the warthog would the eagle consume? Ooh, uh, um, yeah, uh, as much as possible, I suppose, without being too facetious. Um, I, I, I really wouldn't know if there are some bits that it, that it would choose not to consume. Uh, would leave any any larger bones behind, I think. Um, but mm, yeah. And then fur further on that, um, the really good question: How long will a meal like this last, a marshal? Um, taking okay. into consideration that if it's a female, mm. she could be feeding chicks. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, just working through a few things here. I'm, I'm guessing, uh, and Nazim can confirm, this is probably around November, December. Now, the Marshall Eagles breed, uh, I think it can breed any time of year, but mainly in the, in the winter. And uh, um, so if it's only feeding itself, prey like this could last it days, maybe three days. Um, if, it's, if it's got a chick to feed, um, between, you know, taking some food for itself and the chick, I guess that's, that's a day's ration, more, more or less. Um, there was also that question of why didn't the uh, uh, mother warthog come back and, and scare off the, the martial eagle? I suppose, um, and, and here, this is just my feeling about this, I, I'm not up on, on warthog behavior in any detail, but it had at least three other little warthoglets there. And maybe it took a decision there. I'm gonna look after the three good ones, um, the three healthy ones here, uh, in a sense, knowing that this little hog was probably already badly damaged by the attack. Um, that's, that's as good as I can get and it's a guess. Yeah, it's interesting one that uh, I actually saw at the beginning of that video. I didn't see the mother uh, when the when the, the 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 piglets ran over the road. Um, so that would be interesting to, to if you ask Nazim about. Yeah, it, it, there are scenes in the in the full video I think on YouTube um, where like there's there's a moment where the mother and the and the other uh, baby warthogs actually come back and and kind of watch for a bit and then they run off. They didn't try and stop it. Um, but they did come back. Um, there are some yeah. questions coming in um, on, on YouTube and Facebook. So the one uh, is from Maria and she asked, do, do eagles ever hunt in groups ever? Has it ever been seen? Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of eagles. Um, I'm aware of crowned eagles hunting in pairs. And I think the same with veros or black eagles, in which essentially one of the birds acts as a decoy, allowing the other bird to essentially come up behind the prey and nail it whilst it's watching um, one of the eagles acting as a decoy. I'm not aware ever of eagles attacking uh, prey together, such that you would have, say, two eagles on um, actually getting their, their claws into the same prey at the same time. Haven't come okay. across that at all. Before we move on, Adav, um, would you mind sending um, the chat group a, a link to, to sign up to the course? 
Um, mm-hmm. If anyone's interested in, in any of our courses, it's, it's, um, it's no obligation for you to sign up if you fill out the form. It's just that we can send you a little bit more information about what goes on in, in the Kruger and the Be- Begin Birding courses with Aldo. Cool, yeah. So I've, I've sent it to all the, all the chat rooms all over the place. Right, thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Nadav. Nadav. So uh, I think l- last important question here. Um, from Helene Mayer, how can you differentiate between male and female marshal? So it's essentially size. Um, and I did come across somewhere, someone suggesting that the females are more heavily spotted. Now, um, I can't tell you uh, relatively whether this is heavy spotting or not. I'm, I'm guessing because this is a fairly large prey item, I think that it would tend to be a female. <laughs> Essentially, I think if you're a very, very skilled observer, you will know, uh, okay, this is a really big martial eagle, it's a female. Uh, there, there, no other plumage difference other than that spotting that I could come across. Um, also, before we move on, there are some other interesting questions. Um, there was one by S.A. Wolf. Um, and, and that person asked, where does the marshal come from? Yeah, in Marshall, meaning the even. name. Nadab. Yeah, like, yeah. I, where I does presume, marshal? I, I presume marshal, you know, it relates to sort of military um, meaning, I think. Uh, it relates back to that. So I, I, I assume that the name of this huge, magnificent eagle then is related to this, this strong uh, military power, you know, um, aggression kind of background. In, in that sense, it's a very appropriate name. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, that does make sense. Uh, and then another interesting question was, do martial eagles usually eat on the ground or in a tree? Or like what would make them uh, decide that? They would, they would usually try and, and get the prey off the ground. Uh, into into a tree uh, b- simply because it gets them out of the way of competition from other predators. Uh, if if they've got a really big prey, and you could see the difficulty it, that Marshall Eagle had in crossing the road, it was dragging that. It might not be able to lift prey at the at, at the high end of the range. So they would eat some and eventually take it up into a into a tree. Okay. Okay, I think that's um, that's more or less all the questions from uh, from YouTube Thanks, and, uh, and Facebook. That's There's great, a few more uh, questions on this side. What we'll do is, if um, if we've got some time at the end, then we can always just come back to them. Yeah, I'd just okay, like welcome. to say, well played, Nazim. <laughs> Very cool. So we're on to our last video, Snake Eagle versus Cobra. Um, Nadav, who <clears throat> shot this? So this video was by Catherine Ake. And um, this is actually on the S25 um, near Crocodile Bridge. Because I, I remember that because uh, she actually posted this in real time. And so people uh, who were in the area could have actually gone and experienced this themselves um, on later sightings. Um, but it's just one of those amazing, amazing interactions between a, a brown snake eagle and a, and a spitting cobra. Uh, and this has been seen 11 million times uh, by people all over the world. Not grabbing the head anymore. It's crazy. Oh, oh my god. Above head is, is still alive. The cobra is gonna sap. Look at that. So you can see the excitement there. Um, I, I I don't blame the <laughs> the guys in the car to get the the name wrong there. I mean, you're so excited. You, you're seeing what's going on. And, and so they call it a puff adder, but they, they, re, they correct themselves later on. But um, this is a good spot, Aldo, to, yeah. to identify the snake eagle here. Okay. Yeah, you know, Kruger's full of these big brown eagles and, and they present a serious identification um, issue. As, and so we deal with it in the Kruger with Aldo course. In the case of a brown snake eagle, look at the look at the legs, the bare legs. Look at the big rounded head. 
and those big pale staring eyes. Little during this this video, you'll see when the bird turns to face you, you get these pale staring look on the bird and a uniform color. But the, the sort of big headed, round eyed, uniform brown and the bare legs are important because most of the raptors that have got eagle attached to them and their name have got feathered legs. So here the, the brown snake eagle takes on a um, Mozambican spitting cobra. I think we're going to see a, a clip now where it turns to face the, the camera. Um, are, are these <laughs> snake eagles immune to, to the venom? Uh, no, they're not. But in a sense, they are armored. Because if you think about the snake trying to bite an eagle, it's actually... The, the, the feather covering of those birds is quite tough and quite difficult to penetrate and therefore quite easily, I think, to deflect the fangs from a snake. Uh, and secondly, those, those bare legs, those scaled legs, um, I think a fang there might easily be very, very easily deflected. Uh, one really interesting thing I did come across is a mention that rehabilitation organ organizations sometimes get blinded snake eagles. So it is a Mozambique spitting cobra. And so I presume from time to time, um, these, these cobras might, and it's probably going to be juvenile birds again, get uh, uh, a face full of, of spit from a cobra if, if they are, are not careful. So they're not immune, no. And do snake eagles only eat snakes? The, um, yes, essentially. They are snake specialists, which is quite remarkable. If you think of how seldom we see snakes, and yet these birds are probably killing essentially, you know, a snake a day or every two days. And if they're raising youngsters, um, two adults uh, would deliver, say, up to three snakes a day. So... They will also get, bring in some lizards and very occasionally, um, you know, a rodent or something like that. But they specialize on snakes. And have a look. I'm not sure if we get a, a chance, but I was talking about how big the talons were on the Marshall Eagle. Look how small, relatively speaking, the talons are on this brown snake eagle. And that is because they have to grab relatively, uh, you know, small, uh, narrow-bodied prey. So they have to have a tight grip with very sharp talons. We have a, oh, there, I, I actually missed this shot, but I'll bring it up in a, in, a, in a screen grab. Here's a nice screen grab of the underwing. Yeah, so, Emil, if you can just point out the secondary feathers there with your cursor. So the secondary feathers are the inside feathers of the wing. So you can see the cursor on the screen there, and you can see those silvery feathers. Now, both the secondary feathers, which are the flight feathers um, closest to the body, and then the primary feathers, which are the big feathers furthest away from the body on the wing, they silvery in color. And that really helps to identify the brown snake eagle in, in flight. So that's a, a brilliant view uh, of that ID character. It's an important one for this species. So Manuel asks a good question, Aldo. Um, yeah. What is the normal attack mode of the snake eagle? They would normally, um, uh, so they are perch hunters, still hunters, mainly, not entirely. So they're sitting on a high point looking, watching for snakes. They would then fly in and, and um, hit the snake hard and try and break its back. Uh, they would take off the head or bite behind the head, ideally, and do it in that way. Uh, I have to assume in this case that either that first attack failed. I mean, that's a big snake it's after. It's a really big snake. Or um, it just saw the snake on the ground and, and, and flew in to try and have a go at it. Um, again, 
maybe vehicles being there scared it off, but I don't see any chance of that brown snake eagle. Uh, well, I shouldn't say any chance, but it would be really difficult for it to kill that cobra from mm. from uh, the situation which had developed here. Alicia Diedrichs, does that answer your question as well? We could wait for her to respond and then answer Lisa. Oh, there we go. Yes, thanks. Uh, Lisa Harlow, are they resident or migratory? Uh, brown snake eagles, resident. Nadav, any questions from the web? Yeah. Um, so there is one question of the yellow eyes. Is that something that's special to um, the brown snake eagle? Or like, what can you tell us about the yellow eyes that it has? Um, look, the a number of um, uh, of of the eagles have uh, have pale eyes. A lot of them tend to have dark eyes. So it's that character in combination with with others um, that uh, um, are key for identification here. In terms of functionality and so on, I, I can't really comment on that about a pale eye versus um, a dark eye. A lot of the raptors will change from uh, dark eyes and juvenile to to pale eyes in in the in the adult. Okay, and then we have a question from um, Nick Mateos. He asked, "Do the snake uh, like the when the snake eagles catch a snake? Do they eat it, do they eat it like instantly all the time, or do they ever like store it for later?" Um. They, they will swallow. Sorry, I've just seen that the sunshine's reflecting onto my face. I'm just going to move over here. Um, they, they will swallow. They will swallow it. And in fact, apparently, if it's a big snake, sometimes they'll uh, regurgitate it back up again and swallow again until it's it's sitting nicely. So essentially, they uh, they will essentially try and take everything in at once. They've probably got a massive crop as well. In other words, uh, uh, holding area, if you like, um, just below the beak to help them take in a really large amount of prey. If they're taking it back to the nest, they will then regurgitate the whole snake there and the youngster can then pile in and, and eat it more at its, at, at its leisure. Okay, cool. Um, there's quite a few more questions that, that have come in. Um, Jadine asks, do they go for all, sort of all sorts of snakes or do they kind of have a favorite? They, uh, I think they'll take anything they get, but um, in, in looking at the, the lists of prey, quite often it's, it's big venomous snakes. And I, I, don't know, I don't know that they're selecting venomous snakes other than um, so it's spitting cobras, they eat a lot, puff adders, um, and in fact the biggest snake that I could find on record for this was a 2.7 meter black mamba. Well, if you're going to take on a dangerous wow. snake, uh, I reckon a 2.7 meter black mamba is as tough as it gets, so, but they'll eat anything. Okay, um, another question um, on, uh, from Facebook from Melissa. She asked, does, does this eagle have like a protective eyelid in case uh, like venom from the spitting cobra actually hits it? Yeah, that's a good one. Eh? All birds have got a protective eyelid. It's called the nictating membrane. So unlike ourselves as, as mammals, um, it's like having a, another eyelid which is transparent. Um, and I presume that uh, if... If that, uh, so occasionally when you're looking at birds, you'll sometimes see they've got like white across the eye and that'll be that membrane, which has covered the eye. And if by chance uh, a, a cobra spat at that point and, and it hit the outside of the membrane, I presume it's gonna help protect the eye, uh, but it's not there specifically to, it hasn't evolved specifically for snake eagles as a protection. Okay. Um, another question is from Andrew on YouTube. He asked if there's any record of a snake eagle being constricted by a python. 
Um, not by a python, but uh, snake eagles have got into trouble with big snakes, other big snakes. Um, I may have to go back on uh, on that, and I think I think the short answer is yes. Um, there are records of of snake eagles getting into serious trouble. I would have to look again and see if it. Um, uh, Nadaf, I'm just scraping my memory here. I think it can. It, I think it has been recorded as leading to the death of both of the participants in this at okay. times. So, yeah, being a predator is dangerous. <laughs> um, uh, Nadav, sorry. Um, yeah. We've still got two questions from um, Zoom. Okay. Um, firstly, uh, how do the snake eagles survive in winter when they are snakes? when the snakes are hibernating. That's from Alan Bamberger. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And I think part of the answer to that is they, they're actually living mainly in the, uh, in the hot, hotter lowland areas uh, in, in which even in winter, there's a little bit of snake activity. And perhaps at that time of year in particular, they are, uh, will also, uh, I'm guessing that that's when they would be available to take just about anything. There is, of course, less cover in winter. So although the snakes are less active, uh, what is active is going to be more visible. Um, they breed in summer, which, which is also sort of evidence of the snakes being more available in, in greater numbers in summer. Good question, that one. Yeah, very well done there, Alan. Um, last question from Zoom's Jen and Nev. Um, ask once they have swallowed the snake, does the poison ingested not affect them? Um, apparently, they will decapitate uh, um, the the, um, the the poisonous snakes or, or snakes. As a rule, uh, the short answer is um, um, they, clearly, if you ingest poison. It's a different way uh, of venom, of the venom getting into you versus being injected through your, your venous system. And, and maybe that is also part of the answer. Clearly, if brown snake eagles were very, very or yeah, snake eagles were very susceptible to poison, um, I, I think they'd be, uh, they would have evolved into extinction by now. <laughs> Okay, I've got, a, I've got an interesting question from, uh, from YouTube, which I um, never thought of, is why don't these eagles just take the snake, fly up into the air and just drop it from very high? Like, would that, would that hurt the snake? Yeah, yeah it would. But uh, uh, I, I think the shortcut is when you grab it the first time, that's when you kill it. So uh, if you come in hard hit the snake hard, uh, break its back, uh, then it's dead. Remember that what we are looking at here is an unsuccessful attack. Normally, okay. it would come in and essentially kill uh, or really damage the snake on the first strike. So the, there is no need to take it up and, uh, and, uh, and drop it again. Okay. Another interesting question was, um, you, you mentioned that uh, an eagle has eaten a, a, a 2.7 meter mamba. How would it be able to eat that and then fly away? Would it not be too heavy? That's from Parker on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it did occur to me as well. So I, I actually don't know how that worked. Um, okay. You know, I do know actually at times they will actually carry a snake in their claws. So it, it may well have been that with a snake of that size that it was even eaten in a couple of sittings. Um, so maybe in, in a circumstance like that, it, 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 something different to the usual may have happened. So yeah, it's another good question, that one. Very right, cool. No, there's, there's so many questions here. Um, another one, um, do they ever hunt at night, eagles? No. Or any birds of prey? Well, the owls, of course. But okay. uh, the, the others rely on, on superb eyesight first and foremost. And uh, 
when it comes to killing at speed in uh, in stoops and attacks, um, it's all about the visual sense and and good eyesight and so on. Okay, and is there any record of their success rate at hunting? Uh, no, that's that is a good question. That, and I'm I'm guessing that it's it might even be relatively low. Um, I couldn't come across any information on how successful they are. Remembering they, I guess, they are aiming to be successful in the region of once a day, and and that's it. So um, then a kill is a fairly rare event uh, in the course of a day, just one occurrence or one every two days. And uh, yeah. Okay, cool. No, so there's a lot of questions, um, but we've kind of done uh, with the with the videos, right? But everyone's saying, especially on YouTube, like don't end it because they have so many more questions. So <laughs> okay. I don't know if you have any, I don't know if you have any closing words to, to maybe people who do want to like, or have other places to be at the moment. Uh, and for some people who just want to stay on for maybe another 10 minutes um, yeah. and ask other questions. The dev before, before we go on with that, could you just send the link again on the chats? Um, Quite yeah. a few people are asking, and I can't seem to copy and paste for some reason. <laughs> oh, cool. No, I'll do that now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, no, you know, no. when... Aldo, sorry. Yeah, um, I just wanted to to thank everyone uh, for joining us. And and I love the questions. Uh, uh, it's it's really great. The, had, had some really good questions come out there. It's the kind of thing that really teaches us all something, watching this and trying to analyze it uh, afterwards and understand it. So thank you to all of you for your questions and uh, uh, happy to take more if, if the opportunities are there. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'll start off with another question um, from Mrs. Lapwing um, on YouTube. She asked, are any of the birds that we've seen today on the endangered list? Uh, very much. The Marshall eagle in particular. So in the modern world, the big birds of prey are at risk. Uh, and the Marshall eagle is classic because uh, it, it will kill, for example, domestic chickens, as well as um, um, other small domestic uh, stock animals and so on. So in the early days, uh, and even today, it, it would be hunted by uh, killed by people uh, to protect, um, you know, their domestic stock and so on. They will be vulnerable to poisoning. So Kruger is really important as a refuge. It is the primary refuge of Marshall Eagle in South Africa. And there's maybe, uh, there's guessed to be somewhere 100, 150 pairs of them there. It's critically important to them. It's one of the great sightings to have on a on a on a Kruger trip, um, brown snake eagles are, are less under threat. Um, little sparrowhawks have adapted to urban situations. So uh, certainly, where I lived in in Westville in Durban at one stage, we had a little sparrowhawk that would uh, come into the garden there. Um, Jacobins are widely distributed. So the martial eagle is the one that's really a threat. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm just reading through some other questions uh, on, I'll, on, uh, on Nadav, YouTube. While you do that, I'll, I'll ask some questions on this side. Um, <clears throat> one, power lines, do they threaten these big birds? Yes, yes, they do. And it's, um, you know, a lot of people um, I think are all quite surprised that power lines can actually kill the large birds of prey uh, as much as they do, because, you know, we all know that these large birds of prey and vultures and so on have got uh, magnificent eyesight. So I think the answer to that is how often do aircraft fly into, um, into power lines, even though there are pylons and things around. And it's, it's a matter of where you are focusing and looking. Um, and if you're traveling at speed, I think it's quite easy uh, for a bird of prey uh, 
and, and again, younger birds possibly in particular at risk to, to hit um, power lines. One, one bad blow to a wing and you've broken a, broken a wing bone and that's it. It's curtains, curtains for the bird. So nowadays, uh, ESCOM tend to put up markers on, in areas where there are frequent bird strikes but obviously it remains a threat to birds, you know, to these large birds. Um, okay, there's another question here about um, poaching of birds. Um, is that a big issue? Uh, and does that happen? I know with vultures it does, um, but eagles and, and other types of birds? Um, I'm, a, I'm aware of the the vultures in particular being a target for um, traditional medicine because vultures are supposed to have the gift of, of foresight, um, you know, to being able to see into the future. There is also uh, when people are poaching uh, mammals in reserves, they are aware that the circling of vultures in a particular uh, place can give a clue to the fact that there's poachers poaching going on because it alerts the rangers and so on to the presence of dead animals in places. Mm -hmm. And there can be deliberate um, poisoning of vultures um, to kill them so they cannot actually alert the ranging staff. Other, other birds of prey may be poisoned uh, deliberately um, and, and accidentally. So accidentally, people may be trying to poison other predators and, and some of the, well, vultures in particular, but other birds of prey, um, like bateleurs, for example, scavenge kills. And therefore they will be vulnerable to picking up poison baits. The other accidental place is that if, if people are poisoning rodents, for example, and there's a lot of dead rodents around, the raptors can um, eat those and build up um, a, a huge load of poison. So, uh, so poaching is is uh, coming back to the question of poaching. I'm not sure if if I've answered that in in, in the right way. Uh, people are not really um, killing these eagles for food. Um, it's it's normally then as a result of the kind of things that I've, I've mentioned. Poison is a huge issue. So I've got, uh, you mentioned a battalier there, which is, uh, I wanted to bring up a story that I had and I was told and maybe you could confirm it, but I was in the, I was in the, the Kruger once um, and uh, I saw a battalier and a tawny eagle in a tree uh, together sitting next to each other. And I was with a guide. Um, his name is Mark Weiner. I don't know, he used to be on the live safaris as well. Anyway, he mentioned that Battalures and tawny eagles are one of the lowest flying eagles. Um, I think it's because they have like thicker feathers or something like that makes them heavier. So they're usually the first ones to spot a, a kill. And he kind of said that the fact that they were both sitting next to each other in a tree meant that if they had spotted something, um, that whatever they spotted is probably still on the kill. And we actually scanned around and we found a leopard on a kill. And we only found it because of the battalion and the tawny eagle. So I just wanted to know, is, is, that, is that a true fact? That, that those are usually like the first few birds of prey are, that, that spot a carcass? Well, I, I remember once uh, being in a scientific meeting and somebody wanted to see which of the vultures were first to come to, um, to dead animals. And, and experimenting by putting out uh, bits of um, dead animals, basically. And they found that uh, usually the first vulture was a battler. Of course, it's not a vulture, but they were the ones that, that first came to the prey. So I think the issue of them flying lower because they he heavy, they've got heavy feathers, well, that's... Um, that sounds like a load of bollocks, basically. I think feathers <laughs> are feathers. They're the same weight, doesn't matter uh, what kind of bird they are. But uh, I th really interesting, the comment about them um, being low flying and the first to, 
to kills. And I think that's exactly right, that they are specialized in, in, in scavenging two at kills, um, tawny eagles secondarily, uh, battlers as a, as a major source of food. So they want to be lower down to pick up the smaller um, uh, carcasses and things lying around. So that's an interesting one, Nat, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, another question was, um, how far can these eagles spot prey from? Well, <clears throat> I came That's across funny. a mention um, uh, more than once of someone who, who spotted uh, um, uh, a martial eagle coming into a prey from, from more, uh, I think it was two or three kilometers away, um, that it was able to pick up something and come in and detect that. Now, uh, it's going to vary obviously with the size and conspicuousness of the prey. But I think the bottom line is they've got fantastic vision. Um, it's, it's how they make their living. Um, so they have been selected for fabulous eyesight and, and getting it, it right. So I think we have to think in terms of uh, being a great deal better than our own eyesight. Okay, cool. So I think that's kind of it. There's a lot more questions, um, but um, kind of time is, uh, is run up. We've had an hour. I think it's been an amazing, um, I've learned a lot <laughs> personally. And, and, and also just looking through the comments on YouTube and Facebook, um, some actually have done your course and they all said like how much they've learned and how much they were able to take away from it and how they've enjoyed this as well. And I think, uh, it's been really cool. Um, yeah, for me. that's great, Nadav. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah no, thank cool. you very much for the opportunity. Um, uh, on the Zoom side, the chat also, there's a few questions we haven't answered, but um, maybe we should do this again, eh? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I think there's so many, so many different birds that you can, we can analyze. And I know we focused more on the raptors now and the eagles now, but um, yeah, I think there's so many different courses. And I think that's also what you what you deal with in your course. I think the Kruger one, you 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 look at eighty different species uh, for Kruger alone. So so there's a lot there's a lot to learn there. Yeah, great. Thanks, cool. Nadab, Perfect. and thank you everyone that listened in. It, it's been a, yeah. a real pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thank you to everyone who came in. It's been brilliant. Perfect. Um, thanks again, and and good luck, everyone. Thanks, Nadav. And so we hope to see some of you guys on a, on a course very soon. Perfect. Cheers. Bye-bye.